This, of course, was Antony van Leeuwenhoek, as we know him. He was born in 1632 in Delft in the Netherlands. He had a poor education. He, uh, his mother was widowed and remarried. The young Leeuwenhoek was not happy in that relationship and went to live with an uncle and eventually worked with a, a draper, a Scottish draper called Davidson, and began to uh, acquire an interest in microscopes. This is an example of Leeuwenhoek in his early years. Uh, this is a bill as a draper. He signed it himself. You can see that the, 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 uh, they still used three columns of coinage, as we did pounds, shillings, and pence until the late 1960s. Here you can see that bombazine is uh, mentioned on the bill. That is uh, the earliest signature that we have uh, of this, this great man. But he actually didn't invent simple microscopes. They came from Robert Hooke, and I want to put to you this evening both the expression of a problem and its solution, because the problem never seems to have occurred to anybody, and until a problem has occurred, no one's going to look for the answer. But there is a serious problem, because this is Hooke's microscope. He portrayed it in his great work, Micrographia, that was published in 1665 by the Royal Society, and the microscope was made in London by a man called Christopher Cock, and is preserved to this day in the Science Museum just down the road in South Kensington. But if you look through it, this is all you see. Here is a flea, Pulex. And it's, it's a flea right enough. Nobody's going to argue with that. The colour's great. It looks nice and vibrant and jumpy, just as a flea should. But you can't see any details. It's a fuzzy and indistinct image. And yet that's the best that Robert Hooke could see with this microscope. His drawings, however, belie the instrument, because here is his portrayal of a gnat larva, Culex. There is the larva, and look at all these little hairs. None of those could you see with Hooke's microscope, and yet he faithfully portrayed them in his drawings. So we have a mystery here, ladies and gentlemen. The, uh, the truth of the matter is that Robert Hooke used simple microscopes, single-lens microscopes, for all his detailed studies. He showed off his grand compound microscope because it was a, it was a, a consumer toy. It was a status symbol. It was like, like the latest dual processor Pentium. It's the sort of thing that you bragged about. You wouldn't bother to show anybody the abacus in, in the corner or your stapler. I mean, a simple microscope was such a basic, uncomplicated, unrefined, crude little thing. And yet Robert Hooke, <laughs> clearly used a single-lens microscope for those detailed studies, and I shall show you the results that you get with them. You see, when you construct a compound microscope, you magnify the aberrations much more than you magnify the image. Robert Hooke knew this. Robert Hooke said that sometimes I take the central the field lens out of my microscope if I want to make detailed studies because it clears up the image. But in his book, Micrographia, hidden away, is a description of grinding a little tiny lens no bigger than the head of a dressmaker's pin. And that description was picked up by Leeuwenhoek when Leeuwenhoek came on a trading visit to London in 1666, when Micrographia, Hooke's book, was at its height of popularity. And when Leeuwenhoek got back to the Netherlands, he began to make microscopes exactly according to Robert Hooke's design. And this is one of them in the Technical University in Delft. This is the only microscope which actually has no lens. The lens is missing from this little instrument. But that's how he made them. That's the size of a rectangular postage stamp. And he made his little microscopes by hand and ground tiny little lenses, which gave him extraordinary views. This is the microscope at Antwerp, which I photographed in close-up. And you can see here is the stage. Here is the little specimen pin. There is the indentation in the brass where the lens lives. This is the focusing screw, and there's a screw down here to position the specimen. But that's all his microscopes were. But they could show remarkable images. Here is the head of a human head louse, particularly, which I photographed through a single-lensed microscope. And look, now you can see all those little hairs, can't you? Look at these up here. These hairs are about one and a quarter to one and a half microns in thickness. That's all they are. And yet they're easily resolved by this tiny little bead lens of glass. This small, biconvex lens, not much bigger than the head of a dressmaker's pin. 
So just look how clear that image is. Leeuwenhoek made most of his microscopes not of brass, because he had to make the brass himself, and he refined the metals from their ores at home. You didn't just pop into a DIY store. And here's a drawing that I've done to show you how it was built. Uh, this is from the uh, Deutsches Museum in, in Munich. And you can see again the positioning screw and the focusing screw, the specimen pin, which in this example was made of wrought iron, and the back-to-back -back plates of pure silver. He actually got the ore and refined the silver at home in order to make his little microscopes. Now, Leeuwenhoek sent a lot of fine drawings to England. They were sent to the Royal Society. They've been preserved and bound and accessed, and they're in the strong room to this day. And many people have commented on Leeuwenhoek's fine drawings, but in fact, as he said in one of his letters, and I am playing fast and loose with his exact words, but essentially he said, I can't draw for toffee. And he had a limner, a kind of a, an artistic secretary, who would draw what it was that he told them to draw. And this is one of the pages of original drawings facing one of Leeuwenhoek's letters. If you look at the drawings in close-up, and you can see that they're quite remarkably good. These are rotifera. Here is a rotifer hanging out of his little shell with its two wheeled protuberances. Here are vorticellis. This is carchesium. And they're hanging on a root of lemna, the duckweed. You can see it quite distinctly. Beautifully portrayed. Leeuwenhoek said in his letters that he would set up the specimen on the microscope. He would then give it to the limna. And he said, I had to tell him, I'm not paying you to sit and gawp. Get on with drawing the specimen. And, and it was... Leeuwenhoek's direction of what the man should draw that gave rise to these vivid pictures. Now, they were published in Phil Trans by the Royal Society. And, of course, if you imagine that you are the engraver, you're going to sit down with this picture, and underneath you have your plate of copper and your stylus, and you're going to copy exactly, line for line, what is in the drawing. So what happens when it's inked and printed? It turns over. So, of course, it's a mirror image. And by the time those pictures were published... They did indeed come out back to front and uh, were properly labelled and properly published. And as you can see, you've got beautifully accurate drawings. Drawings of, of, of sedentary rotifers like this were not improved upon for probably a hundred years after Leeuwenhoek died. This is a drawing done by Clifford Dobell, you see, CD. Clifford Dobell, who was um, Leeuwenhoek's great biographer. And this shows the way in which the Leeuwenhoek microscope was built. It's a self-explanatory diagram, so I don't need to talk you through it. Curiously, though, Dobell, who was a consummately successful microbiologist and made many great discoveries in the fields of parasitological protozoology, which were not bettered until the 1970s. Indeed, until the work of my good friend Lynn Margulis and other people, the veracity of Dobell's drawings was never understood. It was believed that some of the strange non-mitotic nuclear figures that he featured in his drawings were imagination, or perhaps due to disintegrating cells. But only in recent decades have we discovered that he actually drew exactly what it was that he saw. And yet, here he was, a leading microscopist. He documented all of Leeuwenhoek's work, and yet he never, ever looked through a Leeuwenhoek microscope. I've never understood why he didn't bother to do it. <laughs> 